Hey friends, it's Steven with Leviathan Snakes, and for this week's video, we want to talk about vending reptile shows. Specifically, we want to discuss seven different mistakes that we've either done ourselves or we've seen other vendors do while we were vending or while we were at guests, and how these mistakes can completely kill your chances at having a good show. So, we hope you guys enjoy the video. If you do, please like, comment, subscribe, but let's jump in it. The very first mistake that I want to talk about when it comes to vending reptile shows is not having the proper licenses in order to vend that show legally. And every state is different. Some states are really lenient. Some states you might only need a registration for tax purposes. Other states you need specific permits in order to sell animals of any kind. If you don't do the research, if you don't know what you need in order to vend that show legally, you can be in for a really, really rude awakening when it gets to the show. On the surface level, if you go to a show that requires specific licenses, it is completely within the promoter's rights and probably good for them if they verify that you have those licenses and if you don't have those licenses, they won't let you vend. And if this happens, you pretty much forfeit whatever fees you had paid to rent the table, you had traveled, maybe booked a hotel, you had gone through all of the work to get your animals ready and because you didn't do background research and didn't figure out what licenses you needed, you aren't able to vend the show at all. And honestly, that's probably the best case scenario, assuming that you are going to have some kind of consequences, because it is true that not a lot of promoters check for those licenses. That said, while we were down at Daytona in August, the Florida Fish and Wildlife had come out and they were inspecting people's booths. And we were there as guests, but there were several vendors who were forced to pack up and leave because they didn't have the proper licenses in order to sell animals in the state of Florida. So even though you get the licenses in one state doesn't necessarily mean that they are also going to work for a different state. Mistake number two is mismatching the animals that you should bring to a show. So we talk about this fairly commonly, but I feel when you are looking at the overall reptile hobby, there's a distinct difference to people who want to keep a pet ball python versus people who want to start breeding ball pythons versus somebody who has been breeding for four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten plus years. And each of those different groups have different wants, they have different pain points, and they have different needs that they are trying to solve. So when you are vending a show, if you are vending a local show, for the most part, there might be exceptions, but the vast majority of people are going to be pet owners. They are either first time pet owners and they've never had a reptile before, but they've been interested and they've been doing research and they come out and now they want to see some animals in person for the first time. Other than that, it might be people who are just starting to get into breeding. And again, in this situation, they have not been in the hobby for a very long time. And because they haven't been in the hobby for a very long time, both situations, I think that it is super, super important to bring animals that are going to serve them. And these animals generally are under $500. In addition to the under $500 animals for pet owners and new breeders, I think that if they are visually flashy and that they are essentially cute, I think that you are going to do way better. So if you are really, really excited about the investment side of breeding, and maybe you have made a bunch of double hets and maybe even triple hets, but they're all like normals or a cinnamon triple het or maybe a fire double het or something like this, and they're not super stunning, but because of the genes that they carry, their prices are significantly higher than just a cinnamon or just a fire or even just like a single gene banana. What will end up happening if that's all you have to sell at these local shows, you're going to go there and you're going to realize that most of the other vendors are going to have animals that are specifically geared to those pet markets and those vendors are going to sell their single gene bananas, they're going to sell their bells, they're going to sell single gene pies much, much faster than you are going to be able to sell your double or triple heads because if you have a cinnamon a triple het DG clown exanthic, it probably isn't going to serve the same purpose to a pet owner as it would to a breeder who wants to work the DG Clown Exanthic project. And when it comes to local shows, there's just not that many breeders that are going there and the breeders that are there are probably other vendors and the other vendors already have their projects established. So unless you have the exact animal that another vendor is looking for, realistically, if you're gonna be vending the local shows, we personally believe that you will do way better if you have animals that are dedicated to that pet level level market. 
On the flip side of that, if you're going to be vending a national level show like Daytona or St. Louis or Arlington or Tinley or something like this, the costs to vend those shows are significantly higher. For the most part, most people are going to be traveling for those shows, so you're probably going to have to factor in a hotel where if you do a local show, you might not need to buy a hotel because it's close enough that you can drive to it. Now, once you factor in the hotel and you factor in any travel arrangements, whether it's gas or simply eating out all of the time while you're on that trip, in addition to all that stuff, you are also going to be probably paying significantly more for the table at a national level show than you would for a local show. So we recently did the North Augusta Rep Today, and the North Augusta Rep Today was about $75 per table, which is pretty affordable, and the fact that it's only 10 minutes from the house, even though it's a really small local show, makes sense for us. But we are also going to be vending St. Louis in November, and when it comes to St. Louis, I'm pretty sure that just for one table and electricity for that table, I want to say it was like right around $700 just for that. So it is about 10 times more expensive just on the table cost to vend St. Louis in ARBC than it does to vend a local rep today where we are at. So if this is happening, you really need to make sure that the animals that you are going to be bringing to a national level show have the potential to earn that money back. So if you have a bunch of pet level animals that would be perfect for local level shows, but you are spending $1,000 just to go out and vend a national level show just so you can say you vended a national level show, there is a very, very good chance that even if you sell animals, they aren't going to be enough to actually recoup your costs, and therefore it might make the show feel really bad for you because it feels like that you wasted a bunch of effort and time and didn't get enough out of it. So I personally think when it comes to national level shows, you want to make sure that you have animals that are not just in the pet range. I still think that's a good idea, but you also want animals $1,000 plus because breeders are going to those shows and in order to recoup the costs, you really do need to be making those larger ticket sales. Mistake number three that I want to talk about ties into the last one a little bit, and this is not paying attention to runaway costs. So when I say runaway costs, you can have runaway costs in a single show, but really what I mean is multiple shows in a row. So it's fairly common for people as they're just starting to vend shows to say that any show that they vend is a positive ROI for them because it's getting their name out there, it's getting their brand in front of people, and there is marketing value to this. And while I do agree, there is marketing value to doing shows and getting your brand out there and networking and putting a face to your logo, I personally think that if you are having four, five, six shows in a row that you are essentially losing money on because you're not actually breaking even, you're not selling enough animals to recoup the investment that you made in only those shows, that is probably a sign that there are things that are broken with your approach that you probably need to fix, and if you don't fix them, you're not going to get better. It's a very, very common thing for people to have a bad show or two, but if every single one of your shows you're losing money on, you probably need to reevaluate and figure out what are your weaknesses. Mistake number four deals with one of those weaknesses, and that weakness is having an unappealing show setup. So when you are at a show, if you're there as a guest, what's happening is you are walking through the door and you see a flood of vendors. You see lots of different banners, you see amazing animals, you see some dingy animals. There's a gamut that you see. And you, as a vendor, if you are tr having trouble selling animals at local shows, you may realize that if you're being objective about it, your setup is in the bottom half. It's not even average when it's compared to everybody else at that show. And if you aren't even average, if you are below average on your setup, that perception is probably being brought over to your animals. And the people who are coming to that show assume that if you don't put in the effort to have a professional setup, to even have lights on your animals, or to have a banner, versus somebody who is willing to put in all that work, they may think that you aren't willing to put in all of the work needed to care for those animals appropriately. And this isn't necessarily true, but when it comes to marketing, when it comes to sales, you're really dealing with perception. And if you're shooting yourself in the foot because maybe you didn't want to have to buy a three-tier ARS display, or you didn't think it was necessary to buy the lights for it or to have a professional banner, all of these things are kind of strike marks against you when a customer is deciding if they're going to buy from you or if they're gonna buy from somebody who has the amazing setup right next to you. So. 
For these reasons, I think that the show setup is probably one of the first fixes people should do when they are having trouble selling their animals. If you can attract your customer's attention, then it's going to put you in a position where you can engage with them, which is our next mistake. Mistake number five is a lack of engagement. So it is fairly common when you go to reptile shows that you will see a vendor who is sitting on a chair on their phone, not really looking up, maybe scrolling on Facebook, maybe scrolling on Instagram. And as a customer walks up to their table, they might glance up and say, hey, if you need anything, let me know. And then they go right back to their phone. And what's gonna end up happening is that that customer might look at their animals, but unless the exact animal that they are looking for is on that display, it's a very, very good chance that they're just going to keep walking because there's so much stuff to see at a reptile show that you don't have to only stay at one booth. Instead, you'll just keep walking and somebody else at that show, I can guarantee you, will engage with them. They will ask them what kind of reptiles they have. They'll ask them about the breeding projects that they are working. They are going to try to form a connection with them through engaging with them. And that engagement might be the decision point on whether or not they buy from that person or or if they come back to your booth and buy the one animal that was on your table, even though you didn't put in any work to make a connection with them. One extra thing that I wanna add on to the engagement part of this mistake, and that is, I personally think that it is a mistake to not let people hold animals. And I don't think that a four-year-old child who's never seen an animal before needs to hold your $5,000 clown combo. But I think that if you have a family who is considering getting their very first animal and you aren't willing to let them hold any of your animals until they buy one, it's very, very likely that you are going to lose that sale because while the animals might be beautiful, they're looking to build a connection with an animal that they really, really like. So if you are unable or unwilling to let your animals be held, you're probably going to lose out to vendors who will let their animals be held. And again, I don't think that you have to let every single person hold every single animal, but I think that by engaging with them, by talking to them and figuring out who are the people who are potential customers, not necessarily just there to pet animals. Those are the people that I feel like that you can kind of give a little bit of extra care to and let them hold an animal to see if they build their relationship with it. And finally, if you are really, really hesitant about letting people hold your animals unless they've already bought one, a strategy that I personally feel like works really well is having an ambassador animal. So if you have one animal that is dedicated to like the one that people will hold. Maybe this ambassador animal is really, really docile. It's kind of bigger, so it's not like as fragile as a baby animal. Anyways, this animal can be the one that you direct people to when they want to hold them. And it's very likely that people will end up wanting to buy, somebody will end up wanting to buy that ambassador animal once they form a connection with them. Now, if they don't buy that ambassador animal, when you come back, you just have to make sure that you're going to do a lot of extra work quarantining that animal, doing preventative mite treatment on that animal versus having to do that on every single animal that you brought to that show. Mistake number six deals with that last one, and that is not having a quarantine process when you get back from the show. So you can go to a show, you can kill it at the show, but if you are bringing in diseases, if you're bringing in mites, that can completely ruin any potential gain that you had from that show if you start having animals die or if you have to start going through treatments and you are wasting hours and hours and hours of work treating your animals to make sure that they are not going to get sick and any other animals that you produce aren't going to get sick. So if you're not careful with your quarantine process when you get back from a show, it can completely ruin the entire show experience, even though the show itself might have been pretty good. The last mistake that I wanna talk about is not having a competitive advantage. And when I say a competitive advantage, I don't mean that you have amazing customer service because everybody says that. I'm not saying that you have a passion for reptiles or that you love the animals because again, everybody says that. And if everybody says it, it's not an advantage over your competition. Instead, it's just the baseline of your competition. In order to have a successful reptile business, you have to have great customer service and you have to love the animals. Instead, when I say a 
competitive advantage. This is something that other people haven't thought to do, they aren't able to do, or they are unwilling to do. So one of these specific examples that you could have as a competitive advantage is you could offer a health guarantee. And when I say a health guarantee, not just simply saying that your animals are healthy, but that if they get the animal tested within a certain amount of weeks, maybe it's two weeks, they send off a test, you will pay for the test if they buy the animal from you. It doesn't even have to be about the health of the animal because realistically, we should all be selling healthy animals. We shouldn't be selling sick animals. Instead, you could also offer some kind of testing, refund, rebate kind of thing if somebody tests through RGI. If you have your customers, if you let your customers know that if they test the animal, if they run a full panel on that animal on Morph Market or through Clutch with RGI, and they send you that receipt, that you will refund them, you'll give them a rebate for the cost of that panel. This way, if somebody is looking at your $1,000 animal versus your competitor's $1,000 animal, and they already know in the back of their head that you are going to essentially guarantee the genetics through a full panel with RGI, that might be the decision maker between them because they have something concrete that they can point to why you are better than the next guy. Anyways, we hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, please like, comment, subscribe, but we will see you next week.